I'm Professor Mark Grabowski, and this presentation will provide a brief and basic overview of what is probably the biggest legal issue college students face on the internet, copyright infringement using someone else's work without obtaining their permission. It can include everything from downloading a song to copying a term paper online. Copyright seems to be an issue on everyone's minds these days, and for good reason. Especially with the internet, there has never been a time in human history that we have had so much material, so much copyrighted material, available literally at our fingertips. Similarly, new technologies have turned more of us into publishers and creators of our own copyrighted material. Despite the new medium's expression, however, the same old copyright questions remain. What can I use and what can I use? What can I prevent others from using? The truth is, copyright law can get a bit complicated. Lawmakers and courts have tinkered with and muddied the rules a number of times over the years, and many of the rules weren't so clear to begin with. Still, the ideas behind copyright law are pretty easy to understand and can help a great deal in recognizing where today's legal lines are drawn. Creating a system of copyright protection was actually deemed so important to the development of a strong, healthy society that it was specifically included in the U.S. Constitution more than two centuries ago. At its core, copyright law is about encouraging progress. The framers believed that a society can only flourish when there is a steady advancement in its arts and sciences. To bring about such advancement, copyright law, in its most ideal form, tries to balance two sometimes competing interests. First, copyright law recognizes that it is important that artists, authors, and other creators be recognized and fairly compensated for their efforts. Most writers would be unwilling and financially unable to spend two years working on the next great American novel if, once they were done, anyone could run down to a copy shop, print off or scan 5,000 copies, and sell their bootleg version to others on the internet at 75% off the regular price. Second, copyright law recognizes that encouraging people to create new works will do little to benefit society if others are not permitted to discuss and learn from them. Progress requires a system that allows others to share information and build on the work of others. So what can be copyrighted? The list is long, but not unlimited. In order to qualify for copyright protection, a work must first be original, second, it must be fixed in a tangible form, and third, it must show at least minimal amount of creativity. A work need not state it's copyrighted or have the encircled C symbol to be copyrighted. These hurdles are not especially high and allow for the copyright of most things that people create, including online content, such as photos, whether they are Polaroids or posted on Instagram, articles, whether they appear in the newspaper or on a blog, books, ebooks, paintings, cartoons, website design templates, music, and videos. In fact, there are even special shelves in the U.S. Copyright Office in Washington, D.C. that hold samples of copyrighted wallpaper. And speaking of wallpaper, the wallpaper or background for your computer screen can be copyrighted too. There are, however, certain things or categories of material that cannot be copyrighted. For example, facts and ideas on their own cannot be copyrighted. The Huffington Post, for example, does not own the fact that the stock market went up or down yesterday. Anyone can write a story about that fact, they just can't use the Huffington Post's exact words to do so. Also, most records created by federal government employees cannot be copyrighted. You can, for example, go to the Pentagon's website to download and use Department of Defense photos to illustrate your blog post on military recruiting. Unlike most images on the internet, you don't need the Pentagon's permission though you should still give Department of Defense phot photographers credit. Older works whose copyrights have expired and that have fallen into the public domain can also be used without permission. Finally, the Copyright Office has said that certain categories of works, usually because they lack sufficient creativity, cannot be copyrighted. Titles, slogans, short phrases, lists of ingredients, and alphabetical lists of names are among the things that you can usually use without permission from the copyright owner. Remember, copyright law protects material on the internet. Just because it is now possible to find and download almost any image, 
text passage, song, or movie that exists with one click of the mouse button does not mean it's legal to do so. So you should presume that the same work rules apply to the use of online material as govern your use of print-based works. Got it? So what are the rules? Well, here is the most important one to remember. If you didn't create the material that you want to use or you don't own the copyright to it yourself, you must obtain permission from the copyright owner before you do. Pretty simple. But given that this is a communications course, I should note that there is an important exception that journalists in particular need to know about. Remember the balance we talked about at the beginning between protecting copyright owners' rights and recognizing society's need for readily accessible information? An exception to the general copyright rule, known as fair use, is where that balancing act really comes into play. The fair use doctrine, in effect, is a compromise and it allows for the use of limited amounts of copyrighted works for important purposes like news reporting, commentary, critiques, and education, so long as the use does not significantly cut into the commercial value of the original copyrighted work. For example, a blogger can generally reprint a short passage from a new book to accompany a book review, and a podcast is usually safe to run a short clip from a movie to illustrate its discussion or review of the motion picture. Other fair uses probably include the use of a single frame from a comic strip to illustrate a news article reporting on the retirement or death of a strips creator, reprinting a tobacco advertisement taken from a national magazine to illustrate a blog post on the effect of cigarette advertising on minors, reprinting in a news article two lines from a song that has sparked an international controversy or copying a small portion of information from a website and distributing it to students in a class. Keep in mind that students, teachers, bloggers, the media, and others cannot always claim a fair use. Unless their use meets the fair use criteria, which is not always easy to determine, they must first obtain permission. Still, it is essential to understand the basics of fair use and keep this important exception in mind. A few other things to keep in mind. First, it's not enough to simply credit a copyright owner's work in order to use it. For example, including the phrase courtesy of People Magazine or source NewYorkTimes.com is no substitute for getting copyright permission. Where permission is required, you must actually cop contact the copyright owner or their appointed agent and obtain it. Second, while the law can be an obstacle and admittedly a bit of a pain, if you want to use copyrighted material, it's important to remember that your work is protected by copyright law as well. Unless they can make a fair use argument, others who want to use your blog posts, Instagram pictures, graphic designs, YouTube videos, or other creative works must first contact you for permission. Finally, while we've hit the most important points of copyright law as it pertains to the internet, we've only scratched the surface it's worth taking the time to learn the rules. Ignorance is not a defense, and if you violate copyright law, you can face expensive lawsuits and hefty fines. For example, if you illegally download music you haven't lawfully purchased, you can be fined up to $30,000 per song. Much more information about copyright law is available at the unusually user-friendly website of the US Copyright Office. And if you're in my internet law course, be sure to read this week's readings as they go into much greater detail on copyright law and also touch on other areas of intellectual property that affect the internet including patents and trademarks. This has been Professor Grabowski. Thanks for watching.